Assalamu alaikum. Today we have Brother Ayman here with us to discuss maintaining faith and culture. Brother Ayman Nassad is the founder of the Islamic Leadership Institute of America, which is also known as IDIA, and he's also the chief of academics and research. In this video, we will be talking about maintaining faith and culture, since in this day and age, many youth often struggle to uphold both of them. The first question I have for you, Brother Ayman, is there are many Muslim youth who go to a public school that doesn't have the same values as Islam. How can they prevent themselves from being swayed? Um, this is a very important topic and a great question. So Jazakallah Khairan for, uh, for doing this. Um, I guess it, there's a couple of things we need to pay attention to. One is the creed, the aqidah, and two is the acts of worship. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of us grow up on the basis of do this, don't do that. So if if these youth are growing up in Muslim households, which is majority of the case, uh, they see their parents doing certain acts, you know, of worship, whether they're rituals like salah or fasting Ramadan, or they learn through their parents and other people in their circles, uh, this is not appropriate, this is wrong, this is haram, this is, you know, okay, and so forth. Uh, so they grow up on that without really understanding the creed itself, the aqidah, the core of the, the religion. Um, and when people, whether it's public school or private school, doesn't really make much of a difference uh, because you're really in a society that's for the most part secular. And obviously Islam is uh, a minority way of thinking in this society. So it doesn't make a big difference if the person is in public or private school. Uh, I've seen youth, like you mentioned, uh, leave the dean who went to public, uh, uh, public schools or also private Islamic schools. I think the crux of the matter is how much they understand when it comes to the creed, um, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, his oneness, his qualities, his attributes, um, our relationship with him. Uh, what does the unknown and the unseen really mean, the hereafter? Uh, those are very important concepts that... Um, a person needs to understand at a uh, young age, you know, around 10, 12 at the latest, uh, to have that strong foundation. So that's the first thing. The second thing then comes becomes the habits. And, and that's where the acts of worship falls under that. Um, so now you understand the dean, you're convinced that this dean is, is the right thing. It's, it's, a, it's a logical way of living your life and it makes sense. Then you start to practice it. And fulfilling that practice can happen or not happen based on, on different factors. Uh, people could just be lazy. They're convinced that these rituals, the, the prayer is important. Uh, they just don't do it because they're lazy. That's a different type of problem than questioning the prayer itself. And, and that goes back to the first issue, right? Now, in public school, obviously, the ability to practice the religion is more difficult than a private Islamic school. Uh, because you're just around people who don't necessarily uh, practice the same thing. So if someone um, would, would not be totally convinced with, for example, the, the meaning of prayer, salah, but there's people around him or her who are praying, chances are they might pray with them. And, you know, as the days and years go by, they get to understand it and it has become a habit. So it's easier for them versus someone who did not even get the chance to exercise exercise it as a habit, they, they kind of miss out on that. So, um, you know, I don't know if I kind of answered your question, but I think the, the tip here is we really need to understand the meaning of the religion, the, the creed itself, before we get into the acts of worship and the do's and don'ts. If we don't understand the, the foundation, uh, it kind of is, you know, the whole, the whole faith is standing on a very shallow kind of found, uh, foundation. The next question I have for you is, what should Muslim youth do if some of their family members aren't Muslims and are telling them to do acts that go against the Sharia? Yeah, so there are youth who uh, come to Islam on their own, you know, during adolescence, teenage years, and some of them manage to, to stay strong and they have supporting families and some don't, like you, the example you gave. Um, they just need to be smart and follow the practices of the early Sahaba during the time in Mecca when Islam started as um, uh, a secret way of, of living. 
uh, because they were weak, they were not empowered in the society, they didn't have the support system that was needed. Uh, and there are youth that also I've met who, who uh, have been able to do that and have been successful. We, we had youth come to our local masjid uh, where their parents didn't know that they were Muslim. They embraced Islam at the age of 13 or so on their own. They learned, uh, they got books, they found that it makes sense. And they couldn't tell their parents because their parents um, would not be open to that and would take very restrictive measures on them in their lives. So they, they ended up um, practicing their faith for four, five, six years, kind of um, without their parents knowing until they got to age of majority where they can start making their own decisions and they kind of went to college and became more independent. So that's one uh, thing that these youth can do. Of course, they can also continue to invite and advise their parents or family members to this way of life and without pressure, just giving them information and literature um, and leading by example. So they, they definitely want to be leading and practicing Islam properly based on proper knowledge. They don't want to be uh, extreme in, in their views of Islam where they're becoming more difficult than what the religion requires or is asking for, nor should they be too lax. So if you got a 16 year old who goes out and drinks at night and comes back drunk and he claims to be a Muslim, obviously his parents will be questioning either his commitment to this, uh, this path or this faith, or if the faith even is a legitimate faith. Uh, some parents are educated and they know that the faith doesn't support that. So they would see their son or daughter as someone who's not serious and they wouldn't be supportive. Uh, so those are some you know, high level tips. There obviously every situation is different and kind of needs a different type of, of way of looking at it. The next question I have is, why do you believe that Muslim youth are inclined to follow cultural trends than follow their own faith? I don't think this is uh, unique to Muslim youth. I think it's youth in general. Youth are inquisitive. They're young. They're, um, they're in a stage in their life where they want to learn. Um, they have uh, critical thinking abilities that are strong, and they want to experiment things and try things out and make decisions for themselves. So youth in general um, tend to explore. And with this exploration, they come across trends, some which uh, might seem attractive to some groups of these youth and they could start following it. So it's not necessarily unique to Muslim youth. I think you'll see it in other faiths and other groups. However, studies have shown that minorities in general are more impacted negatively with uh, trends in general and things like that. So whether they're Muslim or other um, minority uh, faith groups or races or people of color, uh, you typically find that they have higher levels of risk in general because they're not uh, part of necessarily, they don't have the access to resources that are available in mainstream society. So in general, that's, um, you know, applicable to, that's the difference I would say between um, these minority groups and the, the mainstream. Um, but the, the advice here, so that's the question, you know, why um, it's because they're inquisitive, they want to explore things, and they don't necessarily have mentors who can uh, guide them and coach them and say, you know, uh, learn about it, but don't, don't think of doing it because it's going to harm you. Um, that lack of um, adult or mature mentorship or, you know, uh, coaching abilities is something that is needed at a young age. Uh, we can go and explore and learn and read and, and so forth. But if we don't have someone to kind of guide us and tell us, watch out, here's a pothole and here's, here's uh, some you know, barbed wire and here's this, uh, they could fall into problems. And then sometimes these problems are difficult to get out of. Last question I have today is, how can Muslim youth find a balance between their faith and culture without giving up on either one of them? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of things that we should also mention here, kind of related to one of your earlier questions, is um, being part of a group of, of believers. Um, that's important. Uh, when people are part of a group in general, they feel empowered. They feel uh, safe and secure. And that's why uh, humans by nature, we, we congregate in groups, whether they're neighborhoods or communities or villages or uh, circles or, or whatever form and shape it is. And when you look at uh, youth in general at school, you'll find they have 
circles and groups of, of, of people, of kids together. You look at correctional facilities, you'll find that people are looking for a group to identify with. They, they want to belong to this group. So for example, um, Islam uh, is spreading pretty rapidly in correctional facilities for various reasons, many of them which are legitimate and you know, sensible reasons. But there are also, especially in the juvenile centers, um, a trend, just like you mentioned earlier, where young people are getting onto the Muslim trend because um, they see their peers wearing a kufi, you know, they go to Friday uh, congregation together and whatnot. But then in that process, they don't necessarily learn their deen. They're, they're joining the group because they feel a sense of safety. These brothers will take care of each other. They would stand up for each other. They're going to be there for each other. So that's a natural human uh, inclination. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran to have strength in yourself by being part of a group that remembers Allah in the morning and at night. So it's really important for Muslim youth to, to be together. Uh, and back to your very first question when it comes to public school, uh, the youth who kind of lose their faith uh, earlier than others are the ones who are not part of the group. They don't go to MSA. They don't mingle and mix with other Muslim kids. They're very detached. And when you're detached, it's easy for you to get swept away by shaitan, just like if uh, a herd of sheep or cattle is not together and one of them kind of, you know, sways out of, uh, of the group, it's very easy for the wolf to come and attack it. But as long as the, the herd is together, it's, it's difficult. So that's one thing that's important is to kind of stay connected with the group, um, with your friends, you know, peers and so forth, even if they um, are not strong in their faith, but, but they remember God, they remember Allah. There's certain things and boundaries they would, they would not, you know, go beyond. So they might make mistakes, they might fall into wrongdoings, but at the end of the day, they still remember Allah. They still know that there, there is a, a, a very last boundary that we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, go beyond. For example, they won't associate a partner with, with God. Um, so that's just uh, something I wanted to share. Now back to your question. Uh, can you remind me what your question was about? Um, it was how can Muslim youth find a balance between their faith and culture without giving up on either one of them? So part of that balance is to be with a group of, of Muslims because then you can do the everyday life things of a teenager with your Muslim friends. So, I mean, young people do many things. They study, they read, they do sports, they watch TV, they spend time with their family, they hang out, right? So uh, some of these things you want to be able to do it because you're young, uh, but also you want to do it in a way, like you said, you're balancing your dean. So if you want to hang out, that's an opportunity to hang out with people who have the same values and ideals as you. So you would go to places that are appropriate. You would do things that are reasonable and correct and, and whatnot. Uh, so that's one way to balance is to be part of, of a group, right? Um, the second way is to really understand the deen. The, the deen of Islam is a beautiful deen because it's very practical. It's extremely pragmatic and, and uh, applicable to every situation and every time that we um, are going through. So it has so much flexibility that it would suit the teenager who's an athlete or the teenager who is an academic or the teenager who likes music or the teenager who likes to go to the outdoors I mean, whatever lifestyle that person has, he or she will find Islam has a solution and has a very easy way to, to go about their lives. So understanding the deen and not just following what we grew up on, which is this is wrong, this is right, but really understanding beyond that, you know, who said it's wrong and who said it's right. Um, it's Allah. And if Allah says it's right and wrong, what does that really mean? And who is Allah? And what are his qualities? And if these are his qualities, how can I uh, leverage and use his qualities so I can be better and balance you know, my, my life and still have a happy, 
a productive life, right? So Islam does not prevent us from progressing, does not prevent us from learning, from having fun, from going out, but it does prevent us from harming ourselves. And unfortunately, a lot of young people, back to that earlier question, uh, experiment with things that are harmful, then it becomes difficult for them to get out of. So for example, they, they try smoking and now they're hooked up to it and it becomes physically difficult because of a chemical dependency. So even if they try to get away from it, it's, it's difficult, right? It's not impossible, it just needs some effort and patience, but it requires some work, right? Um, but the deen, Islam would from the get-go protect them from that because Islam says if you harm your body in any way or form, that's not acceptable, that's, that's prohibited. Your body is sacred and it's, uh, it's not your own possession. It, it belongs to God, you're just a trustee. So understanding that concept that God is the owner and you're just entrusted with something that he owns for a period of time, which is your life here, that's a very different perspective. Then you would, you would get your happiness and your strength through loving God, loving that, that deity, and you would appreciate the advice that he's giving you to not harm yourself. And hence, you know that you don't need to experiment this. You can explore what smoking is. Okay, it's, it's a, you know, a plant, it's a nicotine, or it's marijuana, or whatever it is. It's cannabis, it's got some chemicals in it, and it has pros and cons, but the pros are less than the cons. And I've been warned not to, to use it, so I will be smart and I will follow that guidance, that, that coaching that God has sent us through um, his messenger and prophet. So that's another way to balance our life with our religion is to really understand the religion, to understand why was it revealed? Who is God? Who are those angels? What are their tasks? You know, wh what do these books say? What's in this Quran? Is it just do's and don'ts or are there other things in it? You know, we know there's stories in it, there's do's and don'ts, there's who is God. It answers these basic questions. Also, the other last point I want to mention is because youth are inquisitive, that's how we are kind of created when we grow up during adolescence, we need to recognize that we also become a little hard-headed between certain ages, meaning we want our opinions, we want to stick to it. We have that sense of ego that you know, my parents don't know as much as I do because they're old school. Or I'm up to date with technology and the latest news and I get all these things and I know what's going on, which, which could be true. Uh, the young person could indeed know more than their parents. But we got to be careful that that fact does not make us people of ego and people of prejudice. Because if we become people of ego, we're not going to listen to anything. We're just gonna have this ego in our uh, mind about our own opinions. And that's very dangerous because uh, no one, no human being uh, knows everything. We all need to consult with others, regardless of our age and our backgrounds and education and economic levels or whatever it is. Everyone needs to consult with someone because there's so much information out there. And even the Prophet Sallallahu he would consult with his Sahaba on certain matters during their life. Like for example, they're in a battle and he's trying to protect his people. He might consult with one of the Sahaba, hey, what's the best way to, to avoid this? You know, should we go this way or that way? But he would not put opinions on anything that has to do with the deen. Whatever he gets from God, from Allah, is tra transferred directly to human beings through the Prophet Sallallahu He's not adding or taking anything out. He's not putting his opinion. If people ask him a question, why is it this way? he would wait until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him the answer. So this is the best man who ever walked on this planet. He knew everything that God uh, told him directly through an angel. I mean, look at the honor. He's taught by an angel. But yet, he never had this ego of knowing it all. And that's important because if we don't have that ego, we would be able to listen to others and, and reflect on things and make better decisions, and that would help us balancing things um, as your, your question is asked. Well, Jazakumullah Khairan, thank you, Brother Amen, for your time and your knowledge. Wa'iyakum, Jazakumullah Khairan for doing this program. Assalamu alaikum. Wa'alaikum as